اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ اللذی حدانا لحاذا وما کن لنحتدی اللولا ان حدان اللہ والصلاة والسلام على إمام القبلتين ونبي الحرمين وأفضل الثقلين وجد الحسن والحسين الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الصادقين والذين ذهب الله عنهم الردسة وطاحرهم تطيرا اللهم صلي وسلم وزد وبارك على صاحب الدعوة النبوية والصولة الحيدرية والعسمة الفاتمية والحلم الحسنية والشجاعة الحسينية والعبادة السجادية والمآثر الباقرية والآثار الجعفرية والعلوم الكاذمية والحجج الردبية والجود التقبية والنقاوة النقبية والحيمة الأسكرية والغيبة الإلهية اللهم عجل فرجة وصاهل مخرجة أما بعد فقد قال الإمام زين العابدين لو مات ما بين المشرك والمغرب لما استوحشت بعد أن يكون القرآن ما صدق مولانا الإمام زين العابدين For the love of أهل البيت عليهم السلام صل على محمد وآل محمد For the love of Fatima al-Zahra, salamu allahi alayha, a second salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. For the hastening of the reappearance of the master of our time, a louder salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. When one examines the system of divine guidance, they'll notice that when Allah, whenever Allah he would send his guide, he would send his prophet. He would send them with a miracle according to the medium of that time period. When he sent Nabi Yusuf, within the time of Yusuf, you find the art form of that time was the interpretation of the dreams. So he gave Yusuf an ability to interpret dreams the likes of which no one had. You find in the time period of Nabi Musa, the peak art of that time was magic. So what did Allah he give towards Musa? He gave him that asa, that staff which would turn into a snake and he would give him al yadul bayda. He would give him that luminous hand. You would find while others would use magic that Musa would show a miracle to prove his prophethood. You find in the time period of Nabi Isa, you find the chief art form of that time was medicine. That within that time period, Nabi Isa would be able to cure the leper, to cure the blind, to bring the dead back to life. But you find in the same way, in the time period of the prophet, the chief art form of that time were two. Number one, it was the ability to fight in battle with the sword. And number two, it was rhetoric and poetry. So Allah, he gave the prophet a reply to both of them. In terms of the sword, he gave him the wujud and the dhat of Amir al muminin In the reply... In the reply towards the Arabic and rhetoric, he gave him the Qur'an. That what is the reality of this Qur'an? You know, it's stated every single language. There are two categories. 
The first category of speech is anathar, prose. When I'm speaking right now, this is straightforward speech. This is what's called prose. But the second type of speech within any language is anadam, poetry. But when it comes to the Arabic language, you find the Arabic is that only language where there aren't two categories of speech, there are three categories of speech. That you have prose, you have poetry, and you have Quran. For Quran, neither was it nathar, neither was it nadam. The Quran, it gave a reality to rhetoric, the likes of which society hadn't seen. You know, it stated that when Surah al kawthar was revealed, they put Surah al kawthar on the wall of the Kaaba. Within that time period, there was a poet by the name of Shah Shah. Sheen Ain Sheen Ain. That was his name. This Shah Shah, year round, he wouldn't speak. And he would say, if I speak constantly, there will be times when my speech is eloquent, and there will be times when my speech is not eloquent. So what he would do is that once a year, there would be a gathering with all those people within Arabia, and he would recite his poetry there. But besides that, he would stay silent. So they took this Surah al kawthar towards Shah Shah. They say, oh Shah Shah, Whenever people, they bring poetry towards you, you correct their poetry, you bring it on the right wazan, you bring it on the right meter, O Shah Shah. That when they would bring poetry, when he would go outside his home, he would correct that poetry, but he wouldn't speak. He would only use his pen to correct it. But when they take Surat al kawthar towards Shah Shah, he reads the verses. It says, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. That Shasha who wouldn't speak year round, at that point he says, Ma hada min kalam il bashar, bal huwa fauka min kalam il bashar. He says, This is not the works of an ordinary human being, but it has a higher reality towards it. That you find this is that reality of the Quran. And if you want to understand the Qur'an, you find there is a hadith from our fourth Imam, Imam Zain al-Abideen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. And this hadith is none other than that hadith which I recited at the beginning of this majlis. You know what the Imam says? That if you want to understand the reality of the Qur'an, understand it through the tongues of the speaking Qur'an, those Qur'an al-Natik. Imam Zain al-Abideen, he says, لَوْ مَاتَ مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ لَمَا إِسْتَوْحَشْتُ بَعْدَ إِنْ يَقُونَ الْقُرْآنِ مَائِي The Imam, he states that if everyone upon this planet, everyone from the east to the west passed away, I would not feel any fear or loneliness if I had the Qur'an with me. That the question comes up is that why does Imam Zainul Abideen say this? That when we have the Qur'an, and the Qur'an is a living miracle, you see the difference between the Qur'an and the miracle of the other Anbiya is that to see that luminous hand of Musa, to see that staff which turns into a snake, you had to be in a specific zaman and a specific makan. You had to be in a specific place at a specific time. To see the miracle of Yusuf, it was the same. To see the miracle of Isa, it was the same. But you find Rasulullah's guidance is ila yawm al qiyamah until the day of judgment. Doesn't the hadith say halalu Muhammadin halal ila yawm al qiyamah wa haramuhu haram ila yawm al qiyamah? That what is prohibited by Rasulullah is prohibited until the day of judgment. And what is permitted is permitted until the day of judgment. You find Rasulullah was given a living miracle until the day of judgment. You know, oftentimes we say that we we were in the time period of the Anbiya. We would see the miracles of the Anbiya and we would have strong Iman and faith. But you find the reality is this is that there is a miracle within our homes. It sits upon our shelves. That miracle is the Qur'an. 
that what is the reality of the Quran? Why does the Imam say that if everyone passed away from the east to the west and I had the Quran, I wouldn't feel any loneliness? And why is it that when we have the Quran, we don't feel the same attachment towards the Quran? You find one of the reasons is because we haven't understood the reality of the Quran. From the zahir and the outward, you find that this Quran is 6,600 verses, but the batin and the inner reality of the Quran is that all of the realities which were written on the celestial tablet on that Allah al-Mahfud are comprised in the Quran. That Imam Muhammad al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Imam al-Baqir would say that when you look at a verse of the Qur'an, the verse of the Qur'an has a dahir and a batin. It has an outward and an inward, and that inward has an inward. And he says that there are 70 layers to the verses of the Qur'an. And us Ahlul Bayt are the ones who understand all 70 layers of the Qur'an. That when you want to understand the reality of the Qur'an, one of the ways to do so is to look at the Qur'an. The other way to do so is to look at the narrations of Ali Muhammad. And this is why one of the most potent explanations of the Qur'an, one of the most powerful explanations of the reality of the Qur'an is found within supplication number 42 of as sahifa as sajjadiyah you see, when you look at the time period of Imam Zainul Abideen, the Imam, he wanted to give sermons in the way his grandfather, Amir al muminin would give sermons. But you find the historical circumstances, it didn't allow the Imam to speak openly. Because after Karbala, you find the Umayyad rule would keep such a vigilant watch over the Imam that every move of the Imam would be monitored. So you know what the Imam would do? He would use occult ways to spread the message of Ahlul Bayt and to spread the message of Islam. For example, one of those ways you find is that the Imam, he would train slaves within his home and he would free them. It stated that after Amir al muminin no Imam freed more slaves than Imam Zainul Abideen. You know, it stated one day, that after Medina was pulverized, after Medina was rampaged by Yazid in al waqiatul Harra, you find Yazid, he would send his troops towards Medina. They would desecrate the blessed land of Medina. It stated after that rain, it wouldn't fall in the land of Medina. So it stated at that point, the people, they pray Salatul Istisqa. They pray that Salat in which you ask for the rain to come down. It stated as everyone is praying, a man, a slave of African descent, he goes towards the mosque of the Prophet. The narrator, he says, I saw that man lift his hand. The moment he lifted his hand, the rain, it begins to fall down. I thought to myself that who is this individual? So I followed him through the alleyways of Medina. As I followed him through the alleyways of Medina, I came to the house of Imam Zainul Abideen, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. I waited for some time. I knocked on the door. Imam Zainul Abideen, he comes out. I said to him that I want to purchase one of your slaves. The Imam, he brings out his servants. You find the man, he looks at the servants. He says, no, the one who I want to purchase, he's not over here. The Imam, he calls that servant who was within the mosque out. The moment that servant, he comes. The man says, oh, Zainul Abideen, I want to purchase him. At that point, that servant, he says, oh, Allah, I had promised you that as long as I was alive, I would spend my life in the house of Zainul Abideen. You see, when there were servants in the house of Ahlul Bayt, Oftentimes, these were freed individuals, but they found no better place to remain than the household of Ali Muhammad, that Amir al-Mu'mineen had already freed Kambar. 
Qambar was freed by Amir al Mu'mineen, but he would choose out of his ikhtiyar and his will to spend time with Amir al Mu'mineen. In the same way, this servant, he says, Oh Allah, I had promised you as long as I was alive, I will spend my life in the house of Zainul Abideen. If I am leaving his house, take my life away at this moment. It stated that servant of the Imam, he falls on the ground at that moment. That if you want to understand the status of the supplications of Imam Zainul Abideen, this is that Imam whose servants were mustajabud da'wat. That his servants were the ones whose supplications were accepted in every moment. Now try to fathom the reality of the Imam who would teach those servants. That you find the Imam, he would use different ways to spread the message of Islam. That these servants would be the leaders of society after they were freed. You know, another way that the Imam, he would spread the Islamic message is through the aza of his father. You know, people, they say and we hear that for 35 years, Imam Zainul Abideen would cry for his father, Hussein. That when somebody would place water in front of the Imam, he would begin to cry. When he would walk by a butcher, he would say to that butcher, that did you give water towards that animal? The butcher would say, we are Muslims. It's within the Sharia to give water. He would say that, did you sharpen the sword? He says, yes, I sharpened the sword. He would say that, did you make sure no other animals were watching? He would say, yes, I made sure. The Imam says that when they killed my father, neither did they give him water. Neither did they sharpen the sword. At 70 paces, my aunt Zainab would watch a shimmer would sit on the chest of my father. You know, why would the Imam do this? The Imam is the peak of patience. The Imam, he wouldn't cry because he was weak-hearted, na'udhu billah. But you know the reason the Imam would cry is that when they would see the gham of Imam Zainul Abideen, they would ask the Imam why he is crying and he would give the message of Karbala. That when we have the aza of Sayyid al-Shuhada, it is not only a reactionary role, but you find that there is a level of proactivity towards this aza. That this aza is the means to spread the message of Sayyid al-Shuhada. You know, if in this hall there was a child, and that child was laughing. You wouldn't ask that child why he's laughing. But the moment that child begins to cry, you'll ask him why he's crying. You find that this morning is one of those elements which has kept the school of Ahlul Bayt alive. You find this was another method of Imam Zainul Abideen. But you find the final method of the Imam to spread the teachings of Islam was through his supplications. That this book of supplications, as Sahifa, as Sajjadiya, that even in the Vatican today, they have a copy of as Sahifa, as Sajjadiya. In the Vatican today, Henry Corban would write that within my life, if there was anything which connected me to God, it was as Sahifa, as Sajjadiya. And you know, they are stated that within the Vatican, this book, as Sahifa as Sajjadiya, they keep it in a special section. And they say that this book is for those who are the most advanced of theologians. For the mystical and theological themes found within this book are uncomparable. That if you compare the supplications of the school of Ahlul Bayt to supplications from other schools of thought, and you find the realities of these supplications, you find that they will be enough to show the truthfulness of the school of Ahlul Bayt salam. You know the Imam, that although he couldn't give khutbahs and sermons openly, within these du'as he would give an entire message, he would give an entire course on Islamic theology. And one of those supplications which does so is supplication number 42. You find this supplication is that supplication the Imam would recite upon completing the Qur'an. But when you read the supplication, you find that the Imam, he unveils what the reality of this Qur'an is. And from this supplication, I'll examine five or six points 
so we can understand the Quran and I'll move towards Masaib. But you find the first reality of this supplication. It's found within the opening line. The Imam, he says, Allahumma innaka a'antani ala khatmi kitabika alladhi anzaltahu nooran. The Imam says, Oh Allah, you are the one who helped me to complete this book which you revealed as a noor and as a light. That when you want to understand the first property of the Quran which makes it unique, through the words of Imam Zain al-Abideen, the first quality of the Quran which the Imam mentions is the reality of the Quran as a noor and a light. You know, light is of different types. You have this light which is sitting on top of us, in front of us. You find this is something which the philosophers call a nur al-madhi material light. But you find there is another type of light. That nur which is said, a nur al-mujarrad anil madda. That immaterial light. You find the quality of material light is this is that when there is darkness within a room, you turn that light on, you can see the dahir and the apparent of something. But you find through this immaterial light, you begin to see the haqqaiq and the realities of things. That's why when they come towards the sixth imam, a man by the name of Unwan al-Basri, he says, oh imam, teach me from your knowledge. The imam, he looks at him, he says to him, ya Aba Abdullah, lays al he says, Oh Aba Abdullah, knowledge isn't acquired by learning. He says, He says, The reality of knowledge is that knowledge is a nur and a light which Allah He places in the heart of the one whom He wants to guide. Now, what does this mean that knowledge isn't gained through learning? After all, then what is the point of universities? And what is the point of the Hoza and the Madaris? And what is the point of you listening to this lecture? You find causes are of two types. You have al illatu naqisa and you have al illatu tamma. You have an incomplete cause and a complete cause. An incomplete cause is when the effect does not necessarily emanate from the cause. But a complete cause is when the effect, it emanates every single time. That when you have the sun, you find every single time the rays of the sun, they emanate from the sun. But you find the reality of learning is that it is an incomplete cause. Oftentimes we learn, but we don't retain. Oftentimes we learn, but we don't learn correct information. At the end of the day, to learn, it requires tawfiq min Allah. It requires that reality from Allah. And Allah, he says, ilm is a light which he places in the heart of the one whom he wants to guide. You know, similarly, we see another tradition. When Allah, he speaks about the guidance of the hearts, that tradition of the sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu That tradition of the sixth Imam, it states, Man arad Allahu bihil khayra qadafa fi qalbihi hubb al Hussein wa hubb ziyaratih. That tradition, it states, that whenever Allah, he desires khayr and good for someone, Within his heart, he places the love of Hussein and the love of the ziyara of Hussein. Now the question, it comes up. On one side, one tradition says Allah places the light of ilm and knowledge. And on the other side, he says he places the love of Hussein and the love of the ziyara of Hussein in the heart. That are these two statements contradictions? Is there tadad between these statements? Is there discompatibility between these statements? You find both of them allude to the same reality. And that reality is, is that one, one wants the light of ma'rifatullah and that true knowledge of Allah. It is done through the light of nur. It is done through the light of the love of Hussein and the light of the love of the ziyara of Hussein. That you find this is that first element. The Imam, he says, the Qur'an is a nur and a light. You know, in Ziyaratul Jamia, when you describe the hadith of Ahlul Bayt, you say, Kalamuhum nur, that their words are nur. 
that what does this mean? This means that when you want to unveil the realities of things, when you want to have basira and insight into the true system of the world, you do it through their hadith and their narrations. You know, it's stated that once a person, he comes to Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, they say, oh, Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, my child is sick, can you give a dua? Shaykh Abbas al-Qummi says to that lady that bring me a cup of water. When she brings that cup of water, Shaykh Abbas al-Qummi, he puts his finger within the water. He says, go give this to your son. Your son will be cured. The lady, she takes that water. She gives it to her son. The son drinks it. He gets shafa. He's cured at that moment. She says, what did you recite? That when your fingers, they touch the water, at that moment you find that my son was cured. He says, I didn't recite anything. She says, you didn't recite anything. She says that what I would do is that with these fingers, I've, writ I've, written, I've written thousands of hadith of Ahlul Bayt salam. That do you think Allah won't honor these fingers enough to give cure and shafa towards another individual? That you find this is that reality. So the first thing and the first quality of the Quran, which Imam Zainul Abideen, he mentions, is the reality of the Qur'an as a nur and a light. After that, he says, وَأَنزَلْتَهُ وَفَدَّلْتَهُ عَلَىٰ قُلِّ حَدِيثٍ قَسَسْتَ The Imam, he says, you revealed this book and you preferred it over every single discourse which you have narrated. This goes to show the second reality of the Qur'an is that the Qur'an is a book of guidance, that it was preferred over every single discourse. You know, the Qur'an has history and the Qur'an has science, but the reality is that this book is a book of hidayah and guidance, that when mankind wants to understand the system of Allah, you find it's done through the Qur'an. And this Qur'an, it says, وَلَا رَتْبٍ وَلَا يَعْبِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ It says there is nothing wet nor dry except for it is within this manifest book. You know, the question, it comes up, then does the Qur'an tell me how to drive my car? Does the Qur'an tell me how to program my phone? Does the Qur'an tell me when I go to my medicinal practice how I should treat my patients? But then why does the Qur'an, it say that everything is within this book? You find the reality is this, and I'll explain this reality through an example. That whenever you have an x-ray in front of you, and you're not a trained radiologist, when you look at the x-ray, you find everything is within that x-ray, but you're not able to spot it. Why? Because you don't have the training to understand that x-ray. But if you place it in front of a radiologist, that radiologist will be able to tell you where are the flaws and what is what within the x-ray. Now, both individuals, they looked at the same thing. But one group was able to derive a different reality because they had the qualifications. You find that this book is ma'soom. This book is infallible. This book is a light. The ones who can bring out all of the realities of this book are the ones who are infallible. Because they are the ones with the qualifications that didn't Amir al muminin say upon the member, Saluni, Saluni, Qabla an tafqiduni. That ask me, ask me before you lose me. Then he says, ask me about the Quran. That there was not a verse which was revealed in Medina or outside of Medina, except I know the reality of that verse. He says, there is no verse that was revealed in travel or within the home except I know the reality of that verse. He says, there is no verse which was abrogated or the abrogator except I know the reality of that verse. You find it is a matter of qualification. Otherwise, the principles of everything are found within the Quran. And this is the nature of the Quran as a book of guidance and hidayah. But you find the third principle and the third quality of the Qur'an, which Imam Zainul Abideen, he mentions within the supplication is the universality of the Qur'an. He says that this book is shifa'an liman ansata bi fahmit tasdiq ila istima'ihi. 
the Imam, he says that this book is a cure for everyone who with understanding the confirmation of this book listens towards it. That when you look at the universality of the Quran, and I say this with full responsibility, there is no other book of religion that addresses all of humanity together like the Quran addressed all of humanity. No other book says this line, Ya ayyuhan nas. Now the question it comes up, people they ask this question, that this book was revealed 1400 years ago. How is it relevant to the human being of today? That a book which was revealed in a specific time and in a specific place, how can this book be universal? I say the answer is within the ishkal. I say the answer is within the objection. When you say, how is this book universal? That how can it impact the human beings of today? You find that within this question, you acknowledge them as human beings. That there is something in the nature of insan that no matter whether it is 1400 years later or 2000 years later, he is still called a human being that there is something within our essence that doesn't change. You find the Qur'an, it speaks to that human essence and that human nature within the human being. That's why the Qur'an, it says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلْدِّينِ Hanifa. فِطْرَةُ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهَا It says, turn your way towards that primordial deen, towards that religion upon which you were created. Now, I'll give you another example. The verse, it says, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِيَمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَا لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ Allah, He says, We will manifest for you our signs in the horizons and within yourselves, O human being, until it becomes clear that He is the truth, that He is Haqq, that you find within the human being. Amir al-Mu'mineen says that, O insan, O human being, do you think that you are something small, but all of reality is within you? That the Imam, he says, Man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabba. The one who has understood his reality, has understood the reality of his Lord. You find the Quran, it speaks to this universality. The seerah and the path of Ahlul Bayt speaks towards this universality. That when you look at Karbala, Karbala is not a movement which is mahdood and limited just to the followers of Ahlul Bayt. That when you look at history, you find Shia and Sunni, they've gathered alongside this movement of Karbala. You find non-Muslims have gathered alongside this movement. You know, there was a scholar from the subcontinent, Shah Ahmad Nurani. They said to Shah Ahmad Nurani, they said, oh man, are you Shia or are you Sunni? Imagine you're asking one of the greatest Sunni scholars that are you Shia or are you Sunni? He says, oh man, after Karbala, I don't look at it that way. After Karbala, either you are with Hussein or you are against Hussein. And with pride, I say that I am with Hussein. You know, there was a Sikh guru, a non-Muslim. His student comes up to him. He says to him that go and learn about Hussein. He says, Hussein was a Muslim. What do I have to do with Hussein? He says to him that, would you marry your sister? He says, I wouldn't marry my sister. That is a disgusting thought. He says, why is it disgusting? He says, because my conscience, it doesn't allow me to do so. He says, what you call a conscience, I call that the message of Hussein. That you find Hussein, he avails to the inner reality of the human being. That's why when you look at the history of the subcontinent, within that time period, within the rule of the Qutb Shahi and the other rulers of India, there would be a rigid caste system. That the Hindus, they would have a caste system. But oftentimes, the only time they would break down this caste system was for the message of Imam al Hussein. When the month of Muharram would come, it didn't matter whether you were from the highest caste or the lowest caste. Everyone, they would mourn together. Why? Because of the universality. And Sayyid al-Shohada's universality, it stems from the universality of the Qur'an. You find this was another aspect which the Imam, he mentions in this dua. After this, the Imam, he says, Allahumma, 
فَقَمَا جَعَلْتَ قُلُوبَنَا لَهُ حَمْلَةً The Imam, he says, that, O oh Allah, you have made our hearts a vessel. You have made them a place which carries this Qur'an. When you want to understand the next quality and the unique perspective of the Qur'an, you understand the Qur'an through the divine presence found within the Qur'an. You know, understand this point very clearly. That when you have a translation of the Qur'an, you can translate the meaning towards a certain extent. But what you cannot translate is the divine presence and that tajalli which is found within the recitation of the Qur'an. What is the presence within the Qur'an? that if you want to understand its sacredness, take a regular piece of paper. You can do whatever you want with that paper, but the moment you recite the ayat and the verses of the Quran, the paper is the same. But now you cannot touch it unless you are in wudu. Now you cannot dispose of it in any manner that you like. Why? Because the Qur'an was written upon it. That what is the sacredness of this Qur'an? You know, in a room, the sound waves within the room, they have a normal reality. But in that room, when the Qur'an is recited, even those sound waves and those echoes, they become something which is blessed. That's why the Qur'an, it says, وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ When the Qur'an is recited, listen to the Quran and all of this it manifests within the life of Imam Zainul Abideen you know there is a tradition from Al-Kafi within Usul Al-Kafi it stated that oftentimes that when Imam Zainul Abideen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi when the Imam would recite the Quran and there were people who were walking by the Imam they would go into a swoon of unconsciousness. That it says, Sa'ika min husni sawtihi. That when they would hear the beauty of the voice of the Imam, they would have this type of unconsciousness overcome him. Now the question comes up, is this because of the aesthetic beauty of the voice of the Imam, or is there a deeper reality towards this? Now, without a doubt, aesthetically, the voice of the Imam had beauty. After all, this is the warit of Dawood who would recite the Psalms and the Zabur. But you find when you want to understand this word sa'iqa, you find it occurs in one place within the Quran when it, the Quran it speaks about Musa on Mount Sinai. It says about Musa, Walamma ja'a Musa limiqatina. That when Musa, he went for our covenant, وَكَلَّمَهُ رَبُّهُ And his Lord, he spoke towards him. Musa, he said, قَالَ Rabbi arini andor ilayka. O oh my Lord, show yourself so I can look towards you. Allah says, قَالَ لَن تَرَانِي He says, O oh Musa, you won't be able to see me. وَلَكِنْ اِنْدُرْ إِلَى الْجَبَلِ But O oh Musa, look at that mountain. But if this mountain, it remains in its place, Musa, then you'll see me. But in the Quran, it says, When Allah, he manifested himself. When he did his tajalli towards that mountain, ja'alahu dakkan, that the mountain, it broke into pieces, and it says, وَخَرَّ Musa saiqan that Musa, he would have a swoon of unconsciousness. Now look at this word sa'ika found within the hadith when Imam Zainul Abideen would recite the Quran. The reason Musa would go unconscious is because of that tajalli which was upon the mountain. Now when al-insanul kamil, the perfect man recites the Quran, you find that there is such a tajalli of the divine that when the people would listen to the recitation of Zainul Abideen and the way Musa would fall unconscious, the people, they would fall unconscious when they would hear the Quran on the tongue of the Imam. You find this is that divine presence found within the Quran. And we can look through line after line within this dua. But you find that these days are the days of safar. These are the days where the caravan of Ahlul Bayt, that from Karbala towards Kufa, from Kufa towards Sham, 
You know, I told you that on this night, I would recite that musibah of sham. That what musibah is this? This is that musibah when they asked Imam Zainul Abideen, O oh, Sayyid al-Sajjad, that what was the most difficult musibah that befell you? The Imam, he would say, Asham, Asham, Asham. You know, I would reflect that why did the Imam say it three times? But you find when some ulama, they did the tashri and the explanation of this line, they said that each time the Imam, he said this line, Asham, it would represent something different. The first Asham would represent the bazaar of Sham. The second Asham would represent the darbar of Sham. The third Asham would represent the zindan of Sham. That what was that marketplace in Sham? You know, it stated that Ahlul Bayt, for a number of hours, they would stand outside the city of Damascus. That the people, they would decorate that city. They would say that it is a day of Eid, for there is a caravan of Baghis and transgressors within this city. You know, Imam, Zain, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, he has a narration, and I won't narrate the full narration. He says that there are seven things which would pain my father in Sham. He says the first of the seven is when they would call us Baghi, when they would call us transgressors. The second of the seven is when they would take rocks and they would throw it upon our aunt Sayyid Zainab. He says the third of the seven is that from the balconies, the women of Sham, they would pour boiling water upon upon the children of Ali Muhammad, that this is a sham. You know, it's stated that when they enter the marketplace of sham, and may Allah grant you the ziyara of Sayyidah Zainab, you know that marketplace, it only takes 10 or 15 minutes to walk through that marketplace. But it's stated that for two and a half hours, Ahlul Bayt, they would go through that marketplace. You know, it's stated within that market place there was a companion of Rasulullah by the name of Sahil bin Sa'ad al-Sa'idi he says that, O oh, Zainul Abideen, is there anything I can do? The Imam, he says, O oh, Sal, bring a piece of cloth. Sal, he says, I wanted to see what he would do with the piece of cloth. You know what Imam Zainul Abideen, he did? He took that piece of cloth. He puts it in between the chain on his neck. He says, O oh, Sal, from Karbala towards Sham, you find that this would burn my neck. You find Alul Bayt. They get towards the door of the courtyard. When they get towards the door of the courtyard, it stated that Sayyidah Zainab she sits upon the ground. I don't know what Sayyidah Zainab she was thinking when she entered the courtyard. But maybe she was thinking that in the life of my mother Fatima, a time it had come with her broken ribs she went towards the court yard it stated that Sayyid Zainab Ahlul Bayt they enter that courtyard in front was Imam Zainul Abideen on one side was Imam Muhammad al Baqir on the other side was Sakina behind the Imam was Sayyid Zainab behind Sayyid Zainab was Umm Kulthum all of the women of Ahlul Bayt they would surround Sayyid Zainab and Umm Kulthum but when they entered that courtyard there was a wife of Yazid by the name of Hind. When Sayyid Zainab, she saw Hind, she says, O oh, Umm Kulthum, do you recognize who that lady is? Umm Kulthum, she says, O oh, my sister, after the martyrdom of Abbas, I'm not able to see in Farley. You find that Sayyid Zainab, she says, O oh, Umm Kulthum, that is Hind who used to work within our house. You find at that point, Hind, she says, 
She says, Min ayyi bilad in antum, that which city are you from? Sayyida Zainab, she says, Nahnu min bilad al Madina, that we are from the city of Madina. It stated that hind from her throne, she comes upon the ground. She says to Sayyida Zainab, I used to work in a house within Madina. Sayyida Zainab says, which house did you work in? She says, I used to work in the house of Ali and Fatima. She says, who do you know from that house? She says, I know Hussein. I know Abbas. I know Zainab. Sayyida Zainab says, oh Hind, you see that head from which your husband, he is taking a stick and he is poking the teeth of that head. That is the head of Hussein. She says, Oh Hind, that is the head of Abbas. She says, Oh Hind, I am Zainab. That you find this is Sham. You know, it's stated that Imam Zainul Abidin he would say that within the courtyard of Sham, we would sit in that makan where the ghulam and the servants would sit. And we sat in the way that servants they would sit. It stated that there were 700 people within that courtyard that Sayyida Zainab, she would give her khutbah. After she gives her khutbah, Imam Zainul Abidin he stands up. You know when Imam Zainul Abidin he stands up, Yazid, he says towards Yazid, he says, li hatta asada hadhil a'wad. He says, oh Yazid, do you give me permission to climb the structure of wood? The Imam, he doesn't say member, why? Because a member is that spot where the fadail of Ahlul Bayt are given. A member is that spot where haq is spoken. That spot where you curse my father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, that spot is not a member. Then after that, Yazid, he doesn't give permission. The people, they begin to say, oh Yazid, let us hear something from this man. Yazid, he says, innahu min ahli baytin. He says that this man is from Ahlul Bayt. Qad zuqqul ilma zakka. These are those individuals that when their mothers would give them milk, within that milk would be knowledge. Imam Zainul Abidin, he gives his khutbah. He says, Ayyuhan nas, u'teena sittan wa fudilna bi sab'in. U'teena al-ilma wal hilma wal samahata wal fasa'ata wal shaja'ata wal muhabbata fi qulub al-mu'mineen. The Imam, he says, O people, Allah has given us six and he has praised us with seven. He has given us knowledge and he has given us forbearance and he has given us generosity and eloquence and he has given us bravery and within the hearts of the believers Allah has placed our muhabbat. Then after that he says, وَفُضِلْنَا بِأَنَّ مِنَّ النَّبِيَّ الْمُخْتَارِ وَمِنَّ الصِّدِّيكِ وَمِنَّ الطَّيَّارِ وَمِنَّ أَسَدُ اللَّهِ وَأَسَدُ رَسُولِهِ وَمِنَّ صِبْتَ هَادِهِ الْأُمَّةِ the Imam says, from us is the Prophet. From us is Jafar al-Tayyar. From us is Ali ibn Abi Talib. From us is Hamza. From us are the grandchildren of this Ummah. You know, as the Imam was given the sermon, the entire tide of the courtyard, it turns towards Imam Zainul Abidin. At that point, Yazid, he says to the Mu'addin, called the Adhan. When he calls the Adhan, he says, Allah, Allahu Akbar, Imam Zainul Abideen, he says, none is greater than Allah. Then the Mu'addin, he says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. The Imam, he says, my hair and my skin and my flesh testify there is none a God other than Allah. Then after that, the Mu'addin, he says, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasul Allah. The Imam, he turns towards Yazid. He says, oh Yazid, is Muhammad my grandfather or yours? If you say he is your grandfather, 
father, why are you lying? But if you say he is my grandfather, then why have you taken his children as captives? You find this Ahlul Bayt, they would spend time in that prison in Sham. You know what happened in that prison. I'm not here to narrate in depth. It stated that there was one girl, the daughter of the Imam. She would cry within that prison. She would say, oh my brother Sajjad, when will we get to go towards Medina? It stated at one point, Yazid, he hears the cries of this girl. He says to his guards that who is crying? They say it is Sakina, the daughter of Hussein. Yazid, he says, why is she crying? They say she's crying because she misses her father, Hussein. At that point, Yazid says, then why don't we send the head of her father? That they put the head of Hussein within a bowl. They cover that tush, they cover that bowl. They send it towards Sakina. When that bowl, it gets towards Sakina. She says, after Karbala, what am I going to eat? They say, oh girl, this isn't food. When she uncovers the bowl, she sees the head of her father. She says, oh Baba, who cut this neck of yours, my father? She says, oh father, after you, they ripped those earrings which you gave towards me. Oh father, after you, they tied her arms from Kufa. <laughs> Ya Allah, through the rights of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, we ask through the right of Zainul Abideen. You know how Imam Zainul Abideen buried his sister Sakina? You know, there was a gatekeeper to the shrine of Sayyidah Zana. And every time I recite this narration, I feel a, a strange inner state. It stated that this gatekeeper had six daughters. One night, one of his daughters, she sees within her dreams Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein, he said that water has come into the shrine of my daughter. You find that after that, a second daughter, she sees this. A third sees it, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. That gatekeeper by the name of Ibrahim al Dimishki, he says, No, we can't go towards that grave. This is the grave of Ahlul Bayt. So he goes, he asks the marja of that time, Sayyid Muhsin al Amili. Sayyid Muhsin al Amili, he says, No, this is an order from the Imam. You find that gatekeeper, he goes within the shrine of Sakina. They dig open that grave. When he goes into that grave, he comes out and crying, he falls unconscious. They say towards him that, why do you cry in this manner? He says, I cry for the ghurba of my master, Sayyid the sajjad <laughs> That when he buried his sister Sakina, he buried her in that aba which he used to wear. He buried her in such a state that her arms were tied and he only had... <laughs> ya Allah, we ask through the right of Imam Zain al Abidin. That wherever the followers of Ahlul Bayt are in difficulty, help them. Ya Allah, we pray for the intercession of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. And we pray for the hastening of the reappearance of the master of our time, Matameh Hussain.